Okay, um, so my name is Cassandra Quave, um, and I'm from Emory University. I'll be speaking today about our work in the Balkans, shifting gear a little bit away from the loose engines and other farm plants. But I do have some interesting stories to tell you about um, medicinal practices um, in the Mediterranean. Um, so I want to just give you a, an overview of the work that we're doing. We're currently um, conducting field studies throughout the Balkans. Um, as some of you may know, uh, about a decade ago or so, I started working with Andrea Pironi in southern Italy, looking at Albanian diaspora in the south. And since then, we've also worked with other um, ethnic diaspora spread throughout um, southern Italy. And now we're also doing more and more work um, throughout the Balkans to do some comparative analysis of current versus ancient uses of these medicinal plants. So in today's lecture, I'm going to focus mostly on my most recent um, field study. I just got back from the field. We were working in Cook's district of in Albania. Um, but I'll also compare some of our findings with what we've seen um, in other areas, like in Tef, also in Kosovo and the Golak region, and in Serbia. Um, for our methods, um, across the board, we've always had prior informed consent and adhere to the ethics um, standard ethics of the International Society of Ethnic Biology. Um, some of the techniques that we use are standard things like uh, always vouchering, depositing in the host country, collaborating with local colleagues whenever possible, um, and in the field using free listing, um, presenting fresh plants when possible, and uh, gathering these kinds of, of data. So to give you a, a bit of a, of a feel for what it's like here, um, so, our original work was done here in the in Basilicata and these Albanian um, groups that immigrated in about around the 15th century. We also just had a paper come out today um, working with some um, South Slavic groups in Molise as well. And um, some of the studies I'll discuss today are those in um, this area of North Albania, um, around Kosovo and here in Serbia. And the red is my attempt to draw the drawing tool to show you kind of what is the Balkans. <laughs> <laughs> so for our most recent field, field study, we um, had a very intensive um, time working in five communities. And we also did a comparative analysis of different ethnic groups in this region. So we worked with both um, autochthonous Albanian groups and also some Gurani. And they um, speak two completely different languages. And fortunately, we had a wonderful interpreter who was something like quadrilingual. So he was um, a great help in, in this work. Um, this line here is the border with Kosovo. So as a remnant of some of the, the Yugoslav wars, this is also kind of a dangerous area to work in because there are many landmines along this border region. And in fact, that was the most common question I got when they saw me limping. Oh, did you step on a mine? <laughs> For my fake link. I said, no, no, no mine. <laughs> um, but you can see here in, um, I've got the different villages, kind of the Garani villages we worked in, where it's Shistovec and Borje here, and then you have these other three Albanian ones of Kolovos, Nolese, Ustrezi. So the topography here is, is quite beautiful. This is Mount um, Jaljak. It's um, around 2,489 meters above sea level. That's the third highest peak in, in, in Albania. And um, you have a lot of agriculture um, and these plots along the um, sides of the mountains. And um, even going from village to village, the flora changes slightly based on elevation and proximity to water. I love this scene. This is um, a, a, a typical scene um, on, a, on a good sunny afternoon. We had a few days of rain. But here you can see a lot of the youth in the area that are still there um, are responsible for helping to prepare the fields. You have um, this young girl that was bringing um, some manure and straw with her mule here to fertilize the field and prepare it. Um, and th they're getting this ready for the planting of rye. And I could give a whole other lecture just on this, because it's a very interesting story of this bukra thekna, which they consider to be a very healthy kind of, um, of grain um, to make bread in the past. But since the fall of communism, they no longer make it. Um, and they say it's because of poor seed quality. But they do um, grow it for their animals. Their other major crop 
Um, I'll get to that in a second. I want to speak a little bit about their foods. They do have, um, they're pastoralists, so they have a lot of sheep, um, some cattle. They typically mix the sheep and cattle uh, milk together in the production of a lot of really um, nice uh, fermented uh, dairy products, different yogurts, cheeses. Many of them include um, some capsicum thrown in there, some um, peppers, and a lot of other fermented um, vegetables as well make up the diet. Some other health foods in the area are, are these um, semi-fermented, kind of, they call juices, but it's not really fruit juice. They basically will take a lot of different wild fruits, they will um, add water to it and let them kind of you know, ferment for a while. And they kept talking about Coca-Cola, you know, when we were interviewing, and I would hear this, you know, I could catch on to some words, I kept hearing Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola. Like, what are they talking about, this Coca-Cola? And what it turns out to be is they would often use the two-liter Coca-Cola bottle to do the fermenting. <laughs> so, <laughs> they're reusing those, recycling and reusing those plastic bottles. Um, other health foods in the area are a lot of, they use a lot of these uh, wild edible greens. You can see here's some rumex that's going into a dish known as pita, also known as burek, depending on which um, ethnic group you're working with. And this nice lady is showing us um, some pita that she has prepared um, using wheat and, and maize flour and stuffed with uh, these cheese and, and wild vegetables. Ah, here we are to the potatoes. I was starting to speak about before. So the other main crop that they, that they grow in this area are potatoes, and um, not only for their own um, diet, but also for trade. And I've never seen this before, and I'm curious to see if anyone else has, this idea of burying the potatoes throughout the winter. Has anybody ever seen that in your area where you work? Where do you work? In Armenia. I think. In Armenia, okay. Well, in the past, they used to bury, have a little area inside the home where they would keep the potatoes in the winter. It keeps them from going bad. They dig a hole, it's lined with some stones, and then they use this uh, fekna, or rye on um, straw, to kind of line it. They put the potatoes in and they last um, throughout from, from the fall, throughout the winter into the spring. I mean, it, it was May when we were there. But um, when they were able to start using fertilizers, they started having greater crop yields. And so they ended up building these little houses I call them like the potato graveyards when they take them out. <laughs> you have to be careful you don't walk into one of them you know, that, that are lined here. And all over the place you find these mounds where they're now storing their potatoes. The problem, however, is that they're still not able to really get these sold at market. Um, to get to these areas, there's a very dangerous road. Um, and it's, uh, there are actually quite a few accidents with these large trucks that fall off the mountain because it's all um, dirt paths, the mud, and the, it was, it's an interesting ride up there every day. Um, now to get into the medicinal plants, because that's what I'm supposed to be talking about, I thought I would start with plantain, since it's everywhere here. If any of you have looked down, you should you know, be walking on it. Plantago major we have here. And there's also, um, in, in Albania, they also use Plantago lanceolata. I like this example because one of the points I want to drive home here, especially for those of us doing nothing botany in Europe, is that while we may not be discovering a lot of new species used in a medicinal way or new, new uh, medicinal uses of new plants, what we do constantly find are new ways that these plants are used. And even though all these different uh, sites that we're working at, in many cases, share a similar flora, the actual way that they utilize these plants differs greatly. Um, so, for example, Plantago lanceolata in, um, in, in, among Albanians in Kosovo, they commonly use those for infections of the fingernails, and they'll combine it with soap and kind of coat the fingernails with that. Um, but in, in the sites we worked in in Kooks, they use it strictly as a hemostatic. So if you have a wound, it will stop the bleeding. That's the only way it's used. It's not used as a superlative. Um, Plantago major, on the other hand, is used as a superlative to draw out pus, um, and for infections, also combined with this fresh clun or this butter that they make there. That's the best butter I've ever had on earth. <laughs> um, there's a great poster, a student here, she's in the back, Suzanne, who's working on salep trade in Turkey. And salep also grows in this region. Um, it's a kind of terrestrial orchid. And this is only one species, or they actually collect many different species. And this is one of the cases of where the people do use this occasionally for 
um, gastrointestinal issues for diarrhea and such, but more commonly as a way to supplement their income. Because remember, their only main um, source of income is this potato trade, in which they are really not even able to sell their crops sometimes. This year was a really bad year to even get it sold, period. So they supplement their income by selling um, certain medicinal plants they find in the region to middlemen. So they actually make very little money. The middleman makes a lot, and it ends up probably somewhere in Europe, maybe Germany, going up to the coast of the borders. Other common medicinal plants are those of Hypericum uh, perforatum or St. John's wort. Um, here, uh, this is my colleague, Dr. Pironi. We're interviewing a woman in Colibos about the use of Hypericum. And they use it as a tea um, for different stomach issues, also for hemorrhoids. And um, similarly to Southern Italy, they'll make an oleolite out of this to treat wounds. So they soak it in olive oil that they actually purchase from the store or other oils. So you have this mixture of local products and also those that are purchased. Chai Mali is um, a kind of a oregano, oregano vulgare, that's used um, as, a, as a sedative in, in Kosovo, but in Cooks it's, it's, it's just considered to be a very healthy tea. And it's really used extensively in northern Albania, but not really at all by the Serbs, even though, again, we have a similar landscape, very different uses of common plants. Another important plant is that uh, Rosa canina. You, they use the fruits or the rose hips here um, in um, different types of teas. It can be fresh or dry, or they may ferment them in those uh, juices that they make for health. And these are used um, in, in, in Kosovo, for example, they're used uh, to treat different renal issues as a cough aid or an anti tussin and an anti diarrheal. And in, um, in other regions of North Albania, it's mainly also for GI complaints. Malag, this is Malvis sylvestris. I like this example because, again, it's another plant found throughout. It's also called Malag by these, this ancient Albanian diaspora that came to southern Italy. So this name has had some retention. What's very interesting, though, is there's not much use of this plant in the study area. It grows everywhere. They don't really even have a name for it, especially in the Gurani villages. It's just there. It's just luli. It's just a, a flower. Um, however, in other areas, like in Kosovo, they do use um, a tea as a mucolytic in a similar way that's done also still in these um, uh, Albanian diasporas in southern Italy. <coughs> so in conclusion, I want to just point out, again, that although they do share the similar medicinal flora, there are many differences in uses and applications. And other issues that are contributing to change in the area are, of course, economic hardship. Everyone wants to escape, and I keep telling them, no, you should stay here. It's beautiful here. <laughs> you don't have the traffic and the pollution in the city. But there are many that are trying to escape, and they leave the country, often um, undocumented, to seek out work um, throughout Europe, and even some in the U.S. and Canada. Um, the other important thing is that understanding these uses amongst different um, groups is important for the future of migrant health especially in Europe, where you have this great movement. It's important for the medical community to be informed and to have a better understanding of how these plants are used. If you ask a physician, how is St. John's wort used, they probably won't know about its use for hemorrhoids or for um, oleolite and topical applications. Um, they think more towards the kind of popular you know, dietary supplement versions of it. And lastly, traditional knowledge is dynamic and prone to change. And you're probably wondering what this picture is about. But I wanted to point out one thing. This girl, she's in the middle of nowhere in these mountains, and she's got a cell phone talking away while she walks to go and um, dump the manure in her field. So it's a new era for research. I have a ton of new um, Albanian Facebook friends. They all view Facebook. Facebook, send us the pictures. So it's a, it's, it's a very different world that we're working in now than even 10 years ago um, with the movement of information. Um, I think I have maybe one minute for questions. and spiritual applications of plants and these really cool um, 
love ceremonies involving, involving Salix. So I'll save that for tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>